Thank you. It's a great privilege to be here and uh, to be invited as the last speaker of this session about uh, the Baltic Railway and the Finland. And uh, the topic I will deliver is about a uh, somewhat heated topic now, uh, especially in Chinese uh, academic circles about uh, the Polar Silk Road, that is the uh, development and opening of the Northern Sea Road across the Russian coast and uh, something highly relevant with China's involvement with the Arctic governance and uh, China and the Nordic, especially like Finland, Iceland, Norway and uh, uh, Sweden and uh, Denmark, the five Nordic states. And uh, I myself has also uh, in past Eight years, I have did some uh, in-depth research on Arctic governance and have many frequent visits to Nordic countries. Uh, this is my second time to the lovely Tallinn city. Last time when I attended the Arctic Shipping Forum in 2016, I take, took the ferry, ferry ship from Helsinki to Tallinn and uh, visited the old town and uh, leave me a, a very good impression. And uh, from uh, this morning's uh, presentations from, uh, uh, from the EU officials and uh, some of the experts from the business sectors and uh, the former speakers from Finland and Estonia, what I uh, will uh, deliver may be a little uh, different uh, with the former speakers. I will most dearly on China's uh, involvement with the Arctic governance and uh, uh, China Nordic uh, cooperation. So uh, I will most uh, dwell on four parts. That is about uh, what about the Arctic governance, inter uh, the features, and uh, what about the development of Polar Silk Road, and uh, the linkage of China's uh, rather hot topic of Belt Road Initiative with the Arctic government, Arctic development, like the shipping and the mining and the oil and gas development projects. And uh, certainly uh, some proposals or opportunities for China, Europe, or Nordic cooperation. Uh, whether China has kind of contribution or whether can China can uh, did some uh, cooperation with the uh, Nordic, Baltic uh, states, even with the Arctic, uh, uh, the Baltic Railway. And uh, lastly, the, about my personal source for China's future involvement. So for, for the Arctic, to the Arctic, as a Chinese scholar, Arctic governance, as to me, as Chinese scholar, I think now it's become one more globalized. What is mean globalized? That is. China and not Japan and Korea and even Singapore and India. The Asian states, Asian countries show some kind of interest to this region. But we respect the sovereignty and the sovereign rights of Arctic states, whether the coast of five and the, the eight member states of the Arctic Council. And uh, I think especially for the globalized Arctic governance, uh, there are four factors or issues that can pro promote the uh, globalized process. That is what we, I call it as a dynamics. I want to take, put a more, much more emphasis on the science and technology advancement, just as uh, the former speaker mentioned about the magnetic, ma magnetic high-speed train and something like this, and for shipping and the ice-breaking technology, I think Russia and Finland and has this kind of very high-level uh, technology for ice-breaking icebreaker uh, uh, manufacturer. And uh, as for climate change, I think it's uh, the melting of the sea ice has created this kind of opportunity for the governance of the region become a globalized issue. And uh, what about the status quo? That is the multi-level governance of the Arctic. And we, we come from the global level. We have the climate change like the UNFCCC, like the environmental and econ ecological protection, we have the Arctic Council, we have the coastal five states, and the sub-regional 
governance, we have Barents, Euro, Arctic uh, Council, and the Nordic Council, Nordic Council of Ministers. And the eight member states of the Arctic Council also have this domestic legislation and the policy. And uh, even at the city, provincial, and the county, we have this local governance structure, like Lapland, Finnmark, Nunavut, Yukon, Alaska, and even in some Russian uh, nations. And uh, for the social governance, we have indigenous tribes, we have Sami, reindeer, herders, we have the uh, Inuit people, and uh, like Greenpeace and uh, Worldwide Fund, this kind of environmental NGOs, and the scientists have played a leading role in Arctic scientific research. So there are some major regimes and platforms of Arctic governance, just I have mentioned some. And the, like the International Arctic Science Committee, which the scientists has played a leading role. And like Arctic Circle Assembly, I think just like this forum, global forum, Arctic Circle Assembly, Arctic Frontiers, North Pacific Arctic Conference, Arctic Shipping Forum, Arctic Business Forum, this kind of what we call these kind of quasi regimes has built up a kind of like official business scholars, has this kind of forum to discuss like Arctic issues, Arctic governance issues and the policy, um, policy from policy sectors and the business sectors, scientific sectors. So this is a, a all round and a interaction a platform for, for all the forces to deal with Arctic governance. What about China's involvement with the Arctic? Uh, each time when I went abroad, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the audience will uh, raise this kind of question. What's the reason? And China, and China will, how China will be uh, as a constru constructive player, constructive role, or as a, what we call as a public goods provider? Uh, maybe some of the audiences uh, have noticed that in just last, last January, the uh, central government of China has published its first document on Arctic policy. So this white, white paper uh, document has, uh, I think, have four key words that is respect, cooperation, win-win, and sustainability. Uh, are highlighted for China's future role in Arctic governance. Uh, as polar studies, especially from the scientific research uh, uh, perspective, I think China is not a newcomer. Uh, till now, China has uh, undertook undertaken 34 an Antarctic expeditions since 1984, eight Arctic expeditions since 1999. And five scientific, we have built five scientific research bases and one yellow station in the Arctic in Svalbard. And we have Xuelong icebreaker and a, a new icebreaker with Finnish Acker Arctic technology will be, I think, will be uh, built up in next year. And uh, we have research plane and other facilities and equipment for this kind of scientific research as a laboratory for high-tech uh, high innovation. This is the helicopter. And for China, I think not only China, like Japan and, and South Korea, and these uh, Northeast Asian states, this kind of Northern Sea Road, especially uh, the Northeast, not only the Northeast and the Northwest Passage uh, across the uh, Canadian archipelago, also aroused some kind of interest, especially for this shortest passage. And uh, like China as a, uh, now is the largest trading partner in the world. So this kind of new shipping routes, I think it's very natural for China as this kind of show this kind of interest towards the, the new shipping name. So now uh, I have read an article written by an Icelandic scholar and also is one of my uh, Icelandic friends uh, wrote an article uh, in Diplomat magazine that uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative has entered the Arctic. Will China's Belt and Road Initiative enters the Arctic? What is the Belt and Road Initiative? I think it's, uh, 
it's a long term. Also, it's a multi year and the framework and a huge, I think it's a, a, a capitalized and I think it's a intensive, a capital intensive largest development project and uh, will affect 4.4 billion people over 60 countries across Asia, Europe, the Middle East and Africa with a connective GDP of 2 trillion US dollars once completed. And uh, it was, has two main parts, that is, the, uh, one is on the land, that is the Silk Road economic belt, and what we call the, at the sea, and there is a 21st century maritime Silk Road. So it has balanced on continent and uh, on, on, on continent on the, on the seaside. So what is the promise and the implications of the Bend Road? Uh, initiative, and I think uh, especially on seven fronts or circles, that is transport, I think highly relevant with the topic uh, in our forum, and energy, trade, information, research, development, agriculture, and uh, tourism. And I think planning uh, maybe in near future will become a hot tourist uh, place for, for Chinese tourists in the future, I think. And uh, uh, the geographic uh, scope also includes China, Central Asia, Russia, and Europe, including the Baltic region. And uh, last year, in Beijing, uh, last, uh, last May, uh, the first uh, BRI summit forum was held, and the next one will be held in 2019. The goal of the Belt and Road Initiative is to connect China with Asia, Europe, and Africa through a network of railways, highways, oil and gas pipelines, fiber optic lines, electric grids and power plants, seaports and airports, logistics hubs, and free trade zones. And some experts have estimated that the long-term investment cost for realizing the BRI is four to eight trillion US dollars. What is the relevance of the Northern Sea Route with the BRI, I call it, it's an extension. The Polar Silk Road, I, by quotation, I think it's a not a, a, a new one. I think it's an extension, northward extension of the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, in this way, uh, since 2012, China's Xilong icebreaker has undertook this is in 2012, uh, six years ago uh, in summer, 2012 summer, that the Xilong icebreaker firstly sailed across the Northern Sea Route. And uh, in 2017, uh, the Xilong icebreaker also take, took uh, the voyage across the Northern Sea Route and uh, the transpolar uh, uh, passage, and also the first time to uh, uh, sail a voyage across Northwest Passage. And even Costco, uh, Yongsheng, and other cargo ships has uh, consecutively uh, three times sail across the Northern Sea Route with some kind of construction parts. So it's kind of, we cannot say it's a feasibility study, but it's still at the early stage of the commercial uh, transac uh, 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 transaction or operation of this Northern Sea route. And uh, now, especially I think uh, maybe uh, most of the audience has noticed that China and Russia, uh, China's uh, uh, Petroleum uh, Corporation and the Silk Road Fund has participated actively in the Sabeda uh, LNG the huge, also is a huge uh, project in the Sabeta area. So this kind of, I think, especially in the summertime to the east and to the west, and in the winter time, also the, 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 the traditional shipping names across the uh, Malacca Strait and the, the uh, 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 Swiss Canal. So this form a kind of a circle, a loop, so it's a kind, 
it's a it's a, it's a transshipment terminal like in the Rotterdam. So some the co commercial operation of the Northern Sea Route is now in full swing, especially in the western part, is from Murmansk to the port of Sabieta. So there are some kind of statistics. And the growth of cargo turnover was facilitated by projects on construction of Sabieta port and on the development of Yamar and LNG project. The increase in the total traffic also affected the growth in the volumes of tra transit traffic along the NSR. Some even estimates by 2022, the volume of traffic across the Northern Sea Route will reach 40 million tons annually. So the Yamar LNG, I think now it's a, a kind of flagship uh, China-Russia uh, cooperation project uh, in, in the Arctic region, especially on energy sector. And uh, China's National Petroleum Corporation has 20% uh, share, and the Dodala French, 20%, and the China Silk Road Fund has also taken 9.9% share. So this also is a long-term and has three-phased project. And uh, the first uh, batch of the uh, LNG have shipped to, to, to the Asian market last winter, I think. What about uh, China, Europe? and especially uh, Lodic uh, cooperation uh, across this kind of uh, policy road or the extension of Belt and Road Initiative. So I think it's uh, very interesting uh, because China has to, uh, took their observer status of the Arctic, Arctic Council in 2013 and the President Xi of China uh, also proposed this kind of, I call it the BRI, Banner Road Initiative, also in 2013. So uh, even before the BRI, China and Europe already had regular dialogues on railway, maritime, aviation, customs facilitation, as well as other issues related to connectivity. And I think various levels, government to government, official to official, and uh, uh, business sector to business sectors. And also, uh, China government and European Commission in 2015 signed a memorandum on the EU-China connectivity platform to enhance synergies between China's BRI and the EU's connectivity initiatives, such as the Trans-European Transport Network. So, uh, as to the BRI initiatives, I think now most uh, uh, prominent is that the uh, 16 plus 1, that is the Central and Eastern European 16 plus 1 mechanism, and uh, uh, has uh, uh, achieved a great uh, in recent years. And uh, the 16 plus 1 flagship project and the most visible BRI project so far is the CEC, is the reconstruction of the railway line between Budapest and Belgrade. Even direct railways have been opened to link Poland, Germany, the Netherlands, France, and Spain to China. And what we call this kind of continental, China-Europe continental uh, bridge project. Costco and other Chinese port companies are investing in seaports in Belgium, in Netherlands, Croatia, Slovenia, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Latvia, and Lithuania. And uh, in 2016, the Riga Declaration uh, during the China CE summit, uh, the leaders attempted to find a synergy between the 16 plus one and EU-China relations. They stress that the infrastructure and the logistic projects and the BRI are in line with the EU-China connectivity platform, including the investment plan for Europe and the projects within the trans-European transport network policy. Even in China now, uh, before I uh, attended the Global Forum, uh, I uh, received kind kind of uh, 
correspondence interview about this Arctic corridor. That is the uh, just as the former speaker <laughs> has said, the the the, the, the tunnel, and uh, even the 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 the, the railroad. Railway to the north, like Kikinis, Rovaniemi, and uh, uh, because I have also uh, visited Rovaniemi and uh, like uh, uh, Tromsø, the, 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 the in, Nor in Norway and some uh, northern cities, and I should say that uh, the facilities, infrastructure there is m much lagging far behind to that to the southern part of. As, uh, like uh, Finland and uh, Norway. So you still have much potential. And I think China and uh, like uh, with the uh, Nordic and the uh, Baltic states, maybe in future we can explore how to uh, synergy or integrate these kind of projects and uh, to achieve kind of win-win results. Uh, so far as I know that uh, at the EU level, uh, some officials, some policy uh, researchers and scholars has shown kind of uh, concern towards China's intention of BRI. Uh, to be frank, I think, uh, I think I think has double tier or double uh, uh, one is business economics also has some kind of strategic strategic intentions. Or, but I think, especially for China-EU relationship, we have this kind of comprehensive partnership. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative is, I think, especially for just uh, in the morning, this morning, that the EU officials has signed and the, the ministers of transportation has shown this kind of earnest or kind of urge for cooperation. And I think both sides has this kind of winning and I, winnings, and how can we to implement it smoothly and uh, uh, highly efficiently? I think it's a, it's a, uh, have a huge potential for us in future. Uh, as a Chinese scholar, because I have uh, deal with the Arctic issues with the Nordic friends and their scholars. Uh, in recent years, and I think especially for China in future, not only in the Arctic, and I think even uh, with the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, the Polar Road Initiative, I think uh, China wants to, to become a public goods provider with what we call. I think it's not only about money, labor, capital, or infrastructure, but also capacity building and the regime development. What I want to emphasize is that, like the capacity building, and uh, even China has uh, sponsored kind of reindeer herd, just I mentioned, the Sami people dialogue about it in Indo Mongolia in 2013. And the regime development, I, as a Chinese scholar, I think China, not the countries has established a very, fairly good uh, communicate, uh, co communication platform, that is CNAC, China Nordic Arctic Research Center. And the next May, we will have the sixth uh, uh, conference in, in Norway. And uh, just as this morning, most of the speakers have mentioned trust. Mutual trust is essential for cooperation. And I think China and Europe are mutual need, especially in this kind of critical moment of this kind of, whether we call anti-globalization sentiment or populist or nationalism, so at this time, multilateral and bilateral cooperation are essential. And uh, the harmonious interaction among the government at all levels, not only like Costco, like CMPC, this kind of state-owned uh, enterprises, and I think Tani is played a leading role in cyberspace rule making. And I think in this area, China, we have also the digital society uh, uh, build, build up, and that this kind of uh, the local people communication are also very essential. So the cooperation areas, not only in the infrastructure investment, like shipping, shipbuilding, agriculture, fisheries, tourism, education, clean energy, and innovation. And uh, innovation also is very important now for China's reform and opening up. And uh, 
China's economy also has experienced the restructuring now. So uh, maybe uh, just uh, this morning that uh, President Xi in, in Hainan province, we also have a high level forum that uh, proposed a new round of opening more widely to the outside world, especially on services, financial sectors, like banking, like insurance. And I think European businesses and European companies are all welcome to invest to, to, to China. And uh, as a Chinese scholar, I think uh, from the mutual study and the communication, I, th I have learned quite a lot from the Nordic friends about like the sustainability, resilient community building, and a clean energy, green development under this kind of soft regime governance. So I think it's a very uh, beneficial for China's future growth and development. Thank you.